There's a question that some uh, key men in the Bible ask Jesus. They ask this question that is so very, very specific. How do I inherit eternal life? Now, it seems like an easy question. If I were to ask you, you would probably say, well, if you say this prayer after me, and I'll do it at the end, okay? I'll give you an opportunity. It is the start. It is the beginning of your salvation walk, your walk with God. But the Bible tells us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So which is it? Isn't it the prayer that you utter at that moment, at the end of a service, or you might be on the street somewhere and a Christian is talking to you, and you say that prayer, doesn't that not save you? It does, if you were to die that day. But what we miss a lot of times and we don't talk about in church is what happens the day after salvation. Right? We don't talk about that. There's supposed to be a journey that you go on as a man of God, as a woman of God, pick your gender, and you're supposed to be growing in the Lord. There's supposed to be a visible change in your life. But I've got to tell you, after 20 years of ministry, I've seen Christian, and I'm talking about as a pastor, I've been a Christian many, many years, but as a pastor, I've seen people come, I've seen people go. And what it boils down to is this. I'll tell you the secret to seeing people becoming a Christian at this age and growing old and strong as a, as a man of God, as a woman of God. It comes down to this. They recognized that salvation was not just one moment. But it's a transition. It's a journey that you go through. And I am, I'm telling you this because... And I'm not talking just about Live City Church. I'm talking about the church. I've seen people make decisions for Jesus, but their lifestyle never changes. They're exactly the same as they were the day before. And, and unfortunately, we've got to own that as pastors. We have preached a gospel that makes it appear that all I've got to do is say the prayer. And if I come to church once in a while, I've got my hell insurance paid up. i got news for you. That's the reason we're sharing these scriptures and we're sharing these messages with you because I want to set you on the right track so that you understand the Word of God and become strong in your walk with God. If you're still struggling with alcohol after all these years, it's an issue of lordship. There's a problem there. And it will keep you in a cycle, and you will never break out of it until you surrender this to the Lord. For some of you, it's a sexual sin. It's a secret sin, and it may not be something anyone knows because it might be pornography. Something no one else knows, but the Lord does. The Bible says, what you whisper in the, in the secret places will be yelled from the rooftops. You will be found out. And I would rather, the Bible says, judgment begins in the house of God. Is it, is it me? Is it getting just hot here all of a sudden? <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's hell right there. But we, we must adjust. We need to understand the word and give an ear to it. So I sobered you up, haven't I? All of a sudden, like, whoa, <laughs> you better listening. All right, give me something. So if you're, if you're alive, pre help me preach this gospel. Okay, preach it with me. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark and chapter 10. And hopefully these guys are so on the ball, they've got the scripture behind me. Mark chapter 10. We're going to read a passage from, from verse 17 to 27. Now, while you're turning there, I want to point out to you that this particular story appears in the synoptic gospels. When you say synoptic, we're thinking Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us, if you go to Bible college, it's called... Uh, the law first mentioned, right? When you mention something once, it's more important than the second time, and it will affect the way you look at it from then on. But here's the other principle I want you to get. When something is repeated in the Bible, it's like, so back in the days, they had scribes that would write, okay? They'd copy the Bible over and over. But they didn't have the computer fonts that we do. Like, we've got bold, Okay, we've got, the, we've got italics to help us. We can even adjust the size. Back then, they didn't do that. What they would do is they would repeat a statement just to make it very, very clear. This is bold. I need you to listen. That's 
why it's repeated in scripture. So as you read Mark chapter 10, understand it's also found in Matthew and in the book of Luke as well. But follow with me in your Bibles, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. Now, you'll find that in, the, in, in Matthew and Luke, there's no running. So each one will begin to uncover something interesting so you get the picture. So we see a different picture in the book of Mark. The man is running up to Jesus. He kneels down and asks, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's only a two-part series. This is why it's so important. Why is it being asked by this particular gentleman? Why is it important for us to look at? We're going to talk about that. Let's move on. Verse 18. Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. If you're here three weeks ago, as I was preaching the first message, I was, I was trying to challenge you with this thought that this is a report card. How am I going with eternal life, Pastor? I would say, ask yourself these questions because Jesus is answering them. So he's gone into more detail. You might be thinking, well, I haven't murdered anyone that, that anyone else knows about. But Jesus said, if, if, you've heard it said, Thou shalt not kill, but I say to you, New Testament grace, if you hate a brother, you are guilty of the fires of hell. Examine your heart for a minute. Is there somebody you hate? Is there somebody in your family, it might be a friend, might be a workmate, that you've been offended with, they really hurt you, and you've held on to it? Do you have a grudge against someone? Well, according to Scripture, New Testament, that's called murder. Thou, you sh must not murder. Okay, so if you miss that one, Okay, <laughs> we've got some time to repent at the end of the service. Okay, how about the next one? You must not commit adultery. Blink, blink. Uh, Jesus said, you've heard it said, you must not, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say to you, if you even look at a woman, obviously women turn this one around, with lust in your eyes, you have already committed adultery. There's another one. Okay, keep going. You must not steal. Have you ever stolen in your life? How many times have you stolen in your life? Okay, so that's your report card. <laughs> Everyone's like, uh, the older guys are like, they're really very honest here. They're, they're pulling it out there. All the younger ones, zip lip, I'm not going to say anything. How about the next one? You must not testify falsely. Someone asked you for feedback, back me up here, but you didn't back them up. You changed the facts slightly. You must not cheat anyone. Did you go on eBay and advertise something as being this, but it was, you didn't tell them about the defect, right? You, you have, you've actually deceived. Ouch. You must not cheat anyone. And he finishes with, honor your father and mother. How are you going with that one? So the, this is all a report card. How are you going with that one? Are you an A, a B, a C, D, or an F? Have you failed? Have a look at this. This man is different. He says, teacher... The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Just think about that. In all this man's sin, in all that was going on in his life, this is how Jesus feels about you. Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The Bible says in other scriptures, he was very wealthy. He was rich. Jesus looked around. And said to his disciples, how hard, the guy's still there, how hard 
it is for the rich, this guy here, to, <laughs> to enter the kingdom of God. How embarrassed would you be? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded then, who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Now, if you read Matthew, if you read the book of Luke, you'll find that the Bible says, at this, the man turned around, his face was heavy, and he walked away. Which means that he was not intending now to give up his wealth. And so the commentators would suggest that this man ended up going to hell. So he did everything that was required of the law. In fact, here's the thing. Uh, if we ask this question, who is this man? Let's try and break this one apart a little bit. When you look at the synoptics, the young man is identified by all th of these three evangelists as being rich. They all said it unequivocally. He was rich. Not a question at all. The next thing we see in Matthew verse 20, that he is young. Okay, a young, wealthy guy. And then it continues in Luke chapter 18, verse 18, and he calls him a ruler. And so what does it mean when you put this all together? He's a rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. And a lot of times it goes over our heads because we don't talk about what a ruler is. According to the commentators, they say it's a reference to the fact that this young guy is a ruler of a synagogue. It would be the equivalent of like a pastor. So this is a guy in charge of everything that went on in their local church. He was the one that would pay the salaries. He was the one that would commission people to make repairs. He would pay the bills. In fact, he would even choose the readings. Now, there are set readings that they're supposed to do, but he had a say in what they read. This guy has a lot of clout, and the reason why it's brought to our attention that he's young is because that is not normal. This is a role reserved for someone who's old. In fact, they would be called an elder of the synagogue, a person who's got gray hair, lots of years of experience. This is somebody you can trust, a person of good reputation. And so you can trust what this guy says, and yet you see here, this is really unusual. He is young. So as you put this piece, the pieces together, you begin to see there's something that is unusual in that not only is he a ruler of a synagogue, but he's also wealthy. And the implication is either he came from a very wealthy household, or this is a self-made man. So think about this. I had a PowerPoint, unfortunately, it did not send, and I had a picture of like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Or Elon Musk. Think about that. Rich, young, but we'll, we'll skip out on that word, ruler of a synagogue, and not that, but rich and young. So think about someone like that who is going out of the way, running to Jesus when he sees him and is kneeling down. Again, this only appears in the book of Mark. This is very interesting. He's kneeling down. A ruler of a synagogue doesn't do that. Neither of those things. They don't run and they don't kneel. He's a ruler. A ruler doesn't kneel. You kneel to the ruler. And so something is very strange about this story. And what's stranger still is the request Jesus makes of him. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven and you can follow me. Now, can you imagine if this is read as every Christian must do this? So look at the person next to you because you you're staring at me with those eyes. Like, I ain't going to be selling nothing, Pastor. It ain't happening in my watch. I'm keeping my stuff. What's unusual is he is the only person in the Bible that we see that Jesus specifically told him, you need to do this. What 
must I do to inherit eternal life? But you know, he's the only one because just before that, we read the story of Zacchaeus, right? This is a chief tax collector. So the tax collectors were skimming money off the top. They were, they were saying, instead of saying your tax is $100 or $1,000, they'd say it's $1,100. They'd add to it. So those tax collectors would take some of that money. Think Matthew, the, the guy who wrote the book of Matthew. He was a tax collector. He did that. But then they would have to give a portion to the chief tax collector. So all the tax collectors would give money to the chief tax collectors, and he's making money off the backs of poor people. They're working their, their guts out, and he's taking money off the stealing from them. And he was taking from the cream of the crop. That's Zacchaeus. But the Bible tells us in a single encounter with Jesus, he didn't come running up to Jesus. He's despised. He goes climbing up a tree because people prevented him from being able to see Jesus. And when Jesus says, I want to eat at your house tonight, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus makes his comment. He says, Jesus, I'm going to give away half of everything I own. Remember, he's a very wealthy man. I'm going to give away half of everything I own to the poor, and I will pay back of the half that he remains four times every person I stole from. I will pay them back four times. Jesus replies, salvation has come to this household. He didn't have to be told, give your money and give it to the poor. He knew because of the repentance in his heart, something had to change. So this is what makes it really powerful. Imagine this young man. He's at the epitome of lay professions. He is wealthy. He is rich. But on top of that, he's gone as far as he can without being a rabbi, but being a person of religious influence because he rules a synagogue. He has been hearing thousands upon thousands of sermons being preached and lots and lots and lots of teaching. He has achieved the coveted position. He should know the ways of God. And yet this man who is leading and ruling a synagogue is asking the most basic of questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And so here's where we begin to unpack the danger of what this guy is living. And I'll say to you, this is not just for him, this is a message for all of us. Here's a key thing that we need to grab hold of. This man was in danger because of self-righteousness. Have a look at what he says when he greets Jesus. He says, good teacher. And I think nothing of that because I don't know how they normally greet back in that day. But as I studied, I realized that is not a normal way to greet a rabbi. You just call them rabbi. But by adding the word good, the only way for, it, for that rabbi to be a good rabbi, because they're considered good already, at least righteous in our sight, is to equate him to God. And Jesus is coming back to him saying, do you have any idea who you are talking to right now? You think you're talking to any old rabbi, but I am God. And you're calling me good, but you don't even know what it is. And according to the commentators, if you put all the stories together, he's using good a lot in the sentences. He basically is saying, good teacher, you know, it's, it's good that we can be here together. And what good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? See the amount of times? Good, 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 good. It's like using the word awesome. How many people use the word awesome? I don't think we use it as much as we used to. We still do. I remember one particular pastor was preaching. I was uh, in my hiatus between churches while I was studying. I was at Highway Church. I was on the preaching team. This Sunday, I, I had the, the Sunday off. And uh, I think it was a pastor's wife is preaching and she was using the word awesome and how it is only reserved for God you can't use the word awesome to any other experience except in a reference to God it belongs to him because when you think of God he's so full of awe beyond anything we could possibly imagine of course as she's preaching I'm saying awesome That's just <laughs> awesome she just said don't use the word awesome and I had the dirty look but here's a guy using the word good. It'd be the equivalent of awesome. Awesome. No, awesome is reserved for God. Why are you calling me awesome teacher? Because Jesus is trying to give him an opportunity to grab hold of himself and realize if we keep going further with this conversation, you're going to hear something you don't want to hear. 
I think perhaps that's why many Christians don't want to go deeper with God because we're not willing to give something up. That one thing that God, you know what it is, but you're not willing to give it up. And what we'll say is, well, see, that belongs to leaders and pastors. They should give everything up to God, but I'm not a leader, so I can hang on to a few things. i got news for you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. There are no baby Christians in the kingdom. There are no lesser callings in the ministry. Okay, as a Christian, there's no lesser calling. You are called to do great things for the kingdom, and you're responsible for your journey with God. We are supposed to be giving everything up for Him because of who He is. And yet we will hang on to some things. And the challenge for us is that we need to realize what is happening in the story. Because as this guy's talking, there is no basis for Jesus to question the ruler's sincerity. If he had a problem and said, no, no, you lied, you stole, you dishonored your parent. He, Jesus, notice Jesus doesn't do that, which means this guy literally was doing it. He was following. He had a tick box of things. Yep, check, I did that. Check, I did that. Check, I did that. And he's, he feels something is missing in my life. And I need to make sure, and I know this teacher, this, he's a miracle-working teacher. He has a greater authority than any other rabbi I have ever encountered. I'm going to ask him. I want to make sure I have ticked every single box. And Jesus begins to push back at him. And Jesus says, you have one thing that you lack. Because he starts with the easy one. Don't lie, don't murder, don't cheat, don't steal. I did all these things since I was a kid. Yep, yep. Okay, one more. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then you can come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he walked away. The, um, most of the translations say he walked away sad. But the actual translation is he walked away grieved cut to the heart because now this is his whole eternity this is his whole future how much are you willing to st to get to lose your eternity with with christ but hang on to your wealth in this lifetime how much is it worth to you and this guy is struggling with it the question i want to ask you is what is keeping you trapped in your sin what is the one thing that you're not willing to give up because it's too delicious? It's too delightful. I'm too used to this. I refuse to give this up. I remember a pastor friend, uh, Pastor Rod, I won't say his last name, and uh, he, he, God got radically saved. He came out of a homosexual lifestyle. God delivered him. He, was, uh, he used to do hair and all this, but he had a problem with smoking. He was called to the ministry. He was still smoking. And back in those days, uh, well, in fact, you can't be a pastor in our movement, I don't know if you know this, if, if you smoke. Just a thing, because it means that every time life gets tough, rather than turn to Christ, you'll turn to your addiction. Yeah. And so this guy's struggling with us. I don't know how he made it, but he was confessing up. And he says, and I'm praying to the Lord. I'm saying, God, remove this, this addiction that I have. God, you've got to take it away. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't go away. And next minute, he's got to pull out another cigarette. He's smoking away. He's struggling with this. And he said, but one day, it came to this one conclusion. And he's listening to another pastor preach. The conviction of the Holy Spirit fell. And he said this, God, I love smoking. I love it. I love my cigarette. I love the feeling it gives me. I feel relaxed when I have. I love it so much. But he said this. This is what was different in his prayer. But if it takes my affection and my heart away from you, I need you to take it away from me because I don't have the power to remove this addiction. The story goes, it was immediately the Holy Spirit, just the power of God came upon him and delivered him from years and years and years and years of smoking. To this day, he's never gone back to it. We've got to take these things and be willing to give everything to the Lord. Why are we keeping ourselves trapped in sin? Have a listen to this. this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 30 says, You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. I've said this to you just earlier. 
But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Can I just make a caveat here? It's not literally saying you should gouge your eye out. It's speaking in metaphors. Okay, let's, let's keep going. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, which means your right hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. There is a uh, sadly, in, in the Christian movement today, people who are preaching that there is no hell. And they're trying to lighten it. They try and go back to the original Greek. They go back to the Hebrew and try and dig, 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 dig deep as far as we can. Well, literally, it's not really saying that. It was a reference to Sheol. Sheol was actually a place where they dumped their rubbish at the edge of a cliff and they threw it. It was a literal place, not an actual hell place. No, no, no. Look at the warning Jesus is saying. If you don't lose that one part of your body, if you don't cut it off, again, speaking metaphors, you are going to be thrown into hell. That's why this rich young ruler who recognizes, I have done everything, I've checked every box that the Jewish faith tells me that I need to make sure that I have eternal life, and I'm still not sure. And so Jesus is telling him, literally, it's not about the tick boxes. It's not, about the it's not about the doing of the stuff. You cannot earn your way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. We are insatiably stuck in sin. Like addicts, we will even lie to maintain our habits. The hater clinic of Queensland gives five reasons why recovering addicts will lie. Here's the first one. They will lie so that they can keep using. I want you to take the reference of addiction and think about it as sin, to keep sinning. So in order to keep sinning, they'll lie. The need to keep using overtakes any other priorities they might have held. The second reason they will lie is because of shame. The easiest option to combat shame is often to simply lie so people think you're here when you're really here. But how can you ever grow if you're pretending you're here but you're really here? The third reason why addicts will lie is to avoid confrontation. Addicts don't just lie to others. They will actually lie to themselves. No, I don't have a problem. <laughs> I don't have a problem. No, I haven't drunk in a long time. I haven't smoked in a long time. I don't have a problem. The fourth reason is denial. Once a person admits to themselves that they are addicted and everything in their lives is going downhill as a result, now they're going to need to take steps to get help. One of the great men in our a church, I'm going to get him to share sometime, Ali, he's got a, a great testimony of what God has done in his life and where he's come from. You need to hear it. Number five, why addicts lie, is to create an alternate reality. They're living in a fairy tale, telling people everything's okay. Praise the Lord. They might be the person who sings the loudest, their hands are up doing the praise and worship, but there's a hole in their heart. And Jesus is addressing this hole in this man's heart because when Jesus began saying to him, you know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, this is about, remember he said that Jesus was once asked a question, if you could reduce all the law and the prophets into, into a singular thought, what, what is it? He said, Love God and love others. You notice that the ones that Jesus gave the man was about loving others. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, honor your father and mother. But Jesus didn't ask him the key crux one. Here's what it is. What's the number one law in the Ten Commandments? Here it is. You love the Lord your God above everything else, no idols, nothing else. The problem with this man is that he had a problem with finances, with money. It was his addiction. It was his drug, his success, his career, the wealth and everything he gained. It was a statement of attainment because particularly among the Jewish people, the richer you are, the wealthier you are, the more righteous you are because I'm doing all the right things and so God is blessing me. We've had this prosperity gospel through the 80s and the 90s, and we were stuck into it. And praise the Lord, there's been a turnaround in this century. We've turned around in this decade. 
But back then, they believed this guy was super righteous because he's super successful. God must be doing something. The problem is he was struggling with mammon. The Bible says either you love God or you love mammon. Some scripture translates it as money. But I like money. How many people like money? Okay. You, you, I need it because I've got to pay my bills. I need it so I can go on holidays. I need it so I can get, I need to get a new fridge. Mine's dying. Money's good. It's not talking about that. It's literally referring to a spirit. Mammon is a spirit. You either love God, who's a spirit, or you love mammon, that's a spirit. But you can't love both. You're either one or the other. So if you're fixated with trying to make money, you are fixated with career, you're fixated, now I don't know what your fixation is, that's your idol, you either love that or you love God. Sometimes you'll contest yourself with this. What are you thinking about during the worship when you're not worshiping God? What were you thinking about when I was preaching till this moment when you were not thinking about God? What were you thinking about? That might be your idol, the thing that you worship. Now let me draw this to a close. The key for this young man to be able to gain eternal life was really quite simple. Now, it, sound, it sounds really drastic. It was drastic for him because it was a trap, and he could not be set free from the trap. There's only one way. I, I remember, I was just reading this article uh, recently from the Guardian newspaper. I've used this illustration multiples of times, but they did it differently here. And it's about how to capture a monkey. You might have heard this one. What they used to do was they would take a hollowed-out coconut, and they would have a chain right, in, in this coconut, it was chained to a stake. And what they would do is the coconut would have rice inside it, but the hole was quite small. You could fit your hand in one way, and that was the only way you can pull it out. But the problem was the monkey would grab hold of that rice and would not let it go. Now, I want you to understand this. The monkey is suddenly trapped, but it actually isn't a trap. Think about this for a moment, okay? It's not actually a trap. If he let go of the rice, he could pull his hand out. The problem is he's trapped by an idea. Because the idea is a principle he has lived by and has served him well. If I hang on to the food, I get to keep it. I get to live. But what he doesn't realize is that you are going to die if you hang on to that food. You've got to let it go to escape. But the monkey refuses and gets trapped in its own greed. Let me ask you that question. Why are you holding on to that thing which keeps you from surrendering completely to God? So you can't, get, you can't open your hand and receive something from God if it's clenched and stuck in the coconut. Turn to the person next to you and say, let go of the coconut. This man uh, is so, uh, Kobe can come on up. This man, distracted by his wealth, believed that riches, his wealth, was a way of, of keeping his righteousness. And it was a basis for meritorious entrance into the kingdom of God. He's thinking, as long as I'm giving money away, as long as I'm paying my tithes and doing these things, I'm going to make my way to heaven. But God was trying to deal with the issue of his heart. Money was more than that to him. It was a trap. My father once told me the story of his calling into ministry. I don't know if my sister knows this. But he, was given a, he came from a life of poverty. His father was a pastor. And they didn't pay well in Indonesia. They couldn't survive. So he had to sell cigarettes, which again, not the Christian thing to do, but that's what people wanted. He'd sell cigarettes and bread to bring income for the family. And so it was an amazing story how his father finally let him go to Bible college. He was given a scholarship. And he graduated. And because he married an Australian, he was given an opportunity to stay in Australia, permanent residency. My parents moved to Victoria, where I was born, and then my youngest sister was born. And he had a job off given to him. He was a radio announcer, so wondering about my voice, professional radio announcer. He did very well. And he had a cush job, 
They had a house in the burbs with a white picket fence, everything he wanted, three young kids. Everything you can imagine of the Aussie dream, this guy who grew up in poverty had it all. And then God, <laughs> God began calling him into the missions. And his, my mother began getting the same calling. And they tried to drown that out. So they decided, you know what we'll do? We'll give money regularly to missions. Every week we'll give money to missions and perhaps that will satisfy God. Meritorious. If I give money, God will be happy. But instead of making them happy, what happened was the calling got louder. And so they decided, you know what it is? We need to give more money. And so they began doubling the amount and putting that into the tithes and offerings plate for missions to be able to stave off the calling of God in their lives. They paid more money. Do you think it worked? No. It got louder and louder and louder. Meantime, my dad had been asking for a raise from his boss for some time and he was not granted that raise. But this one moment when they finally realized this is not going away. Why don't we stand to our feet? This is not going away. I am going to have to deal with this. And so my parents decided we're going to have to give it all up. So my father went to his boss to resign. The boss says, I was just about to offer you the job. You know, is there any way I can change your mind? I would like to give you the job. You've got the raise you were after. You've got the promotion. And my father realized it's a trap. It's another trap. If I take this, I get more money, but the calling of God is still so strong. I can no longer silence it by just throwing money away. I have to surrender my life to God. Can I finish with a story for you? According to Richard Wormbrand, who the founder of The Voice of the Martyrs, and people that you would know of scholars, they believe that the person who was the rich young ruler was actually Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. We know that because most com commentators say in the book of Mark, it talks about a guy who was dressed only in a tunic and that at the time when they came to arrest Jesus, he got caught in the melee, someone ripped his tunic off and he ran away naked. It only appears in the book of Mark very interesting not in Matthew not in Luke not in John why according to the commentators it's because he's talking about himself in no other book does it say that the man ran to Jesus knelt on his knees and asked him what must I do to inherit eternal life imagine if you will for a moment that this young man was Mark a rich young ruler who walked away grieved because he had to give up his entire possessions and we thought the story ended there but the story doesn't end there the story why he was grieved according to most of these commentators is because he's thinking to himself a dialogue how will I tell my parents that I'm gonna give everything up I'm gonna sell everything I have all your achievements son everything that you own your house your land your properties everything you own I'm giving it all I'm selling it all because I know that I need eternal life I can't silence his voice anymore and this knowing inside of my life is telling me I've got to give this up I've got to to give this up the only thing that this man owned was the clothes on his back a single tunic because everything else had been sold and given to the poor would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me I don't know what sin you may be wrestling with I don't know what your trap is, what your coconut is. What is your trap? Why is it keeping you bound in chains where you are and you cannot progress in your walk with God and you refuse to go in your walk with God because the lure of this thing, this trap is too much for you? What will it cost you? The Bible says, what does, it, what does it gain a man who will gain the whole world 
but lose his soul in the process. What gain is it to you to be wealthy in this lifetime, to be successful in this lifetime, to, to be able to please your flesh in this lifetime, but lose your eternity? Eternity is a long time. It's billions and 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 more years. What is your eternal life worth? As I look around the room this morning, I feel the Holy Spirit wants to do a work in people's hearts. And I want to encourage you, the Holy Spirit has been moving upon you not to remain silent, not to remain doing nothing or think to yourself, I'll deal with this later because I don't want them to know I'm struggling. Please don't do that. The Spirit of God is moving in the service right now and He's speaking to you. He's convicting you of sin because He wants to turn things around in your life. This might be the first time that you've understood the gospel. That God has a plan for you. He made you. He created you in His image. And He has no desire for you to go to hell. He wants you to be saved. And He made a way for you. He even paid the price for you. But all that is required is that you accept it this morning. For others, you might have said this prayer before. But you no longer, you realize you've, you've walked away from God. You're not close to Him anymore. You've got your hand in the jar. This prayer is for you. If that's you. As I look around the auditorium today with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three in just a second. But I want to encourage you, if that's who you're saying, I, I want to make sure I'm saved, that I've, I've got eternal life. I want to lead you in a prayer. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. I won't embarrass you. You get to put it down straight away. As I look around this room, one, two, three, go. That's you. Would you raise your hand so I can see it? And I want to pray with you. Who is that person? Thank you. See that hand in the back. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Well done. I'm proud of you. Is there anybody else? Just three more seconds. I won't belabor this. Three, looking around the room. This is eternal life you're talking about. Two, looking around the room. Is that you? One. For those that raise their hands this morning, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But it has to be your prayer. I'll give you the words, but you need to make it your own. And I want the whole church to pray so that they're not embarrassed. So church, will you say this prayer with me? And if you raise your hands, I'm so proud of you. Say this prayer as if it's your own. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry that I could not live up to your standards. You call that sin, and there was a price for my sin. You left heaven and died on the cross for me. Thank you for that. Jesus, please forgive me. Take away my sins. Remove my guilt and give me a new heart. Fill me with your spirit so that I can live for you. Amen. Let's give a hand to all those that responded this morning. God bless you. Sure, Dave.